any other component of the Department of Homeland Security. While air travelers do not always express their gratitude during the process, we do appreciate what the TSA and its employees do to protect our nation. During the partial government shutdown earlier this year, TSA personnel worked without pay. This was a burden for transportation security officers in particular because they earn much less than other civil servants. TSA workers overcame great personal hardship to continue carrying out their duties. There were even reports of personnel sleeping in their cars because they could not afford the cost of continuing uh, to come uh, to work. I hope you will convey our continued support and appreciation for your workforce. I know you share our concerns and have been an advocate for them. After making significant new investments in your workforce and to equip it with advanced security technologies in the bill for the fiscal year 2019, I was disappointed to see that the President's fiscal year 2020 budget proposes a cut to TSA's funding. Many of the cuts are repeats from the past two years based on the elimination of activities that the Congress has repeatedly voted to continue. The visible intermodal prevention and response teams known as VIPER, the Law Enforcement Officer Reimbursement Program, and TSA staffing at exit lanes. There is also a disconcerting mismatch between the budget and the expected growth in travelers. And once again, the budget relies on a proposal to increase the passenger security fee, which is outside of the jurisdiction of this committee and is unlikely to be enacted. Mr. Administrator, I know the budget request reflects the funding limitations you are forced to live under, but it will be difficult to fill in the funding and holes uh, that the budget creates. We look forward to hearing more about the budget request for FY 2020 and whether it would provide the resources that you need to support your critical missions. Thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to our discussion. I would now like to turn uh, it over to the distinguished gentleman from Tennessee, Ranking Member uh, Fleshman. Madam Chairman, thank you, and uh, Mr. Administrator, thank you. I apologize for the delay. We've been voting on the floor. It's been extremely uh, busy today. Uh, Mr. Administrator, I echo the Chairwoman's thanks for coming to testi testify before the subcommittee today on the Transportation Security Administration's fiscal 2020 budget request. Thank you, sir, for reaching out last week to meet with me and my staff and your budget priorities. I really appreciated that, to put a lot of things in perspective. I know we talked about this when we met, but I just wanted to reiterate, on the record, what an outstanding job the TSA team does in Chattanooga at the Chattanooga Airport. I actually told them that I met with you and, and I appreciate that. With all the traveling we do between our districts in D.C., you can have a great experience or a lousy experience, and often that experience can start with the TSA screening process. For many Americans, TSA might be the only face-to-face -face interaction they have with a Homeland Security employee. You have a great group in Chattanooga, sir. I'll have some questions as we move into that part of the hearing. I look forward to your testimony, sir, and I thank you for your time today. Madam Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, before your testimony, uh, just a few Um, look forward to your testimony, and um, we'll put the full statement uh, into the record. Chairwoman Royal Allard, Ranking Member Fleischman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you this afternoon concerning the President's fiscal year 20 budget request for TSA. I value your oversight and support, and thank you for your critical contribution to our mission success. It's an honor and privilege to lead the men and women of TSA, and I very much appreciate both of your comments uh, on the TSA workforce this afternoon. Uh, in my view, they embody our core values of integrity, respect, and commitment. And as both of you has, have mentioned, that commitment was so plainly evident during the recent 35-day lapse in appropriations. I'm immensely proud of this team of professionals who include screeners, explosive experts, canine handlers, intelligence and vetting personnel, domestic and international inspectors, 
federal air marshals, providers of critical support services, and a highly skilled headquarters staff. It's our mission to ensure that our transportation systems, used by hundreds of millions of people per year and a lifeblood of our economy, remain secure. We are hard at work and with your help to provide better security faster. This includes the CT or CAT scan x-ray technology you funded in fiscal year 18 and fiscal year 19 for carry-on bags at our screening checkpoints and its continuation in the President's budget request for fiscal 20. It also includes the credential authentication technology or commonly referred to as CAT by its acronym that you similarly supported to strengthen our performance at the very per first position in our screening checkpoints. The increase in numbers of screeners to reflect the strong and sustained growth in passenger air travel and increases in our canine capability for both passenger and air cargo screening. The fiscal year 20 request seeks $7.2 billion, partially offset by $4.2 billion from the aviation passenger security fee. It has two overarching priorities. The first is continued investment in checkpoint technology, in particular the CT or CAT scan technology and the credential authentication technology. And I'll talk about each one uh, separately for just a few moments. Uh, first, with respect to the CT or CAT scan x-ray technology, five days ago, we awarded our first major contract for 300 x-ray systems. Your demonstration of support for this long-term acquisition was key to our success in obtaining a price that was substantially less than our budget estimates. Not only will this technology provide vastly superior security, it will also be more convenient for passengers, eventually eliminating the requirement for passengers to take la laptops, liquids, aerosols, and gels out of their carry-on bags. The fiscal year 20 request uh, contains $221 million for approximately 320 more of these x-ray machines and the associated baggage handling systems. The second piece of technology is the credential authentication technology. And the fiscal 20 budget continues the large-scale investment in this technology, deploying approximately 500 additional CAT units that will improve identity and travel verification, improve risk management, and also result in more convenience for passengers who will no longer need to present their porting pass in most situations at the screening checkpoint. The second key priority, first being technology, the second is um, right-sizing our workforce. Um, as, as you've noted, commercial air travel continues to grow at 5% per year. This requires an increase in the size of our screener workforce and the staff who support them. This budget seeks over 1,000 additional screener positions that will allow us to maintain our screening throughput standards. Additionally, we have been hard at work in raising the global bar of aviation security. This effort is focused on security measures at the 280 plus last point of departure or LPD airports around the world. An increase in our international footprint is needed and is requested in this budget. Finally, to respond to a changing threat, we revised our concept of operations for the Federal Air Marshal Service that allows us to make a modest downward adjustment to the size of this very important component of TSA while enhancing operational effectiveness. I would also note that we have identified efficiencies in certain aspects of TSA operations that results in approximately $160 million of program reductions to partially offset the need for growth in other areas. In closing, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss TSA's resource needs at today's hearing. I hope you and your staffs have found this very responsive to your requests for information. I am committed to being as open and transparent as possible and I'm always available to discuss any aspect of TSA's operations with you. I look forward to responding to your questions this afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, Administrator, uh, as I mentioned during my opening statement, TSOs and other TSA personnel diligently worked without pay during the recent uh, partial sh government shutdown. Can you, can you tell us how TSA managed this and kept its workforce on the job and whether the shutdown has had an impact on recruitment uh, or retention. Yes, ma'am. Um, the way you manage it is, is multifold. First and foremost, uh, one of the, one of the uh, things that I saw when I first came into this position over a year and a half ago as I traveled around the airports around the country was the deep commitment of the men and women at TSA to the mission. Uh, this is a mission that, that compels performance on the part of men and women in this agency. Uh, as I said in my opening statement, I saw that commitment um, up close and personal uh, during the 35-day uh, lapse in appropriation. I think that was a significant driver um, for people to continue when it was very hard um, to re report for work and do a very difficult job, but they all recognize how critical it is to the safety and security of passengers going through our systems. Additionally, thanks to the um, authority that you've provided in law 
uh, we have a two-year appropriation for our operations accounts. Um, and so that allowed me to use un unobligated fiscal 18 funds. And we were able to do a number of novel things as a result. Uh, we were able to, uh, for example, um, provide bonuses to our, to our frontline screening workforce um, with the idea to get as much cash into their checking accounts as we possibly could. Um, and so that was, that was one aspect that, that, um, that we were able to exercise because of the unique authorities that TSA has. Um, additionally, uh, we were hugely um, uh, rewarded, I think, um, by our airline and the airport partners for the dedication of that workforce. Um, across the entire system, uh, we had uh, expressions of generosity um, and donations of food and other support um, to our frontline workforce that really was very meaningful to them. Uh, additionally, passengers as they're going through the screening checkpoints recognize the fact that, that the screeners that they encountered, uh, if they're a regular traveler on, on a very routine basis, were now working going on at the very end of the shutdown uh, for almost five weeks without receiving pay. And uh, just the, the um, expressions of appreciation, gratitude, and the fact that passengers expressed um, that they valued the work that the TSA workforce was performing uh, meant an awful lot um, to the workforce. Finally, uh, I would say that um, from, from my perspective, my focus is always going to be on the front line of the organization. And, and I've asked all of the leaders within TSA to similarly focus on the front line, to walk around, have a conversation, understand what challenges our employees might be dealing with, and do whatever they can to remedy them. And so, uh, you know, we, we have essentially used the authorities that Congress has provided uh, to the fullest extent of the law, uh, and I think that has paid us big dividends. Uh, in, in, in the, the shutdown uh, impact uh, with respect to attrition um, has been so far actually less attrition, um, but I'm fully mindful of the fact that, you know, individuals sometimes make a decision to stay or leave uh, employment with an employer, um, but don't exercise um, that action for several months afterwards. And so we're going to keep a very close eye on our attrition rates. But uh, but so far, immediately after the shutdown, uh, they are lower than what we've had in the past. And what lessons did you learn during this period that would be relevant in the future if we have another uh, shutdown or uh, some similar type of situation? Uh, a, a couple of key lessons. Uh, wh one is. Uh, first and foremost, to continue to have that um, appropriations flexibility um, so that we can look at two years' worth of appropriations versus just one. Um, the second is to, um, to take a look at potentially, and I know there are, are a number of bills um, up here on the Hill, to look at potentially making the uh, aviation passenger security fee available to TSA uh, either on a regular basis or during a, a lapse in appropriations, and that would give us a a funding base to be able to pay the men and women uh, within the agency. Um, the other thing that's really important to emphasize here is that the, the screening workforce comprises the vast majority of TSA, um, roughly 50,000 of 63,000 employees. Um, but there are an awful lot of employees that were also similarly working that weren't visible um, to, to passengers, and, and they were also impacted by the shutdown. This includes all of our personnel um, that do, in, do vetting operations, that basically look at passenger information before passengers board flights to be able to assess risk by passenger. Um, all of our federal air marshals that provide uh, in-flight security, all of our inspectors at airports around the country that ensure airports and airlines are complying with the regulations we've put in place. And then finally, all of our international staff that, uh, you know, we, we, we have a number of measures in place at those last point of departure airports that I mentioned. Um, that's been a significant uh, work driver, 280 airports, and we have you know, four series of, of different requirements uh, at those airports. And so, you know, the entire organization really pulled together. Um, but I think it, it, it really, at the end of the day, boils down to um, continued sustained leadership involvement and leadership action with respect to our employees and then the leaders having the flexibility to be able to ensure that the front line is able to deliver the services that are so important to the public. Okay, great. Mr. Fletcher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Administrator, hello again. Uh, Mr. Administrator, I have a question. I'm concerned about the threat posed by the largely unmonitored movement of high-risk hazardous materials on our, nation, on our nation's highway network and about TSA's difficulty to address this vulnerability as directed by Congress and as required by law. Section 1554 of the 9-11 Act of 2007 
motor carrier security sensitive material tracking requires the TSA CERP to develop a program to facilitate the tracking of highway security sensitive materials, S HSSMs. Currently, I understand that the TSA has no visibility in the movement of these dangerous materials on the nation's highways. Compounding this, I understand that TSA lacks the basic pro programmatic data on these shipments, the number of shipments, quantity shipped, and the origin, destination, and routing of the shipments. Uh, Mr. Administrator, I was pleased with the commitment you actually made, sir, during your confirmation hearing to revisit the surface security provisions of the 9-11 Act and to implement those that TSA has yet to address. However, TSA has not prioritized this R&D program and work stopped about a year and a half ago with the FedTrack R&D project about half completed. I understand that there's been some preliminary discussion around an approach to implement a tracking center in an industry-funded public-private partnership at no cost to the taxpayer. Uh, my question, can you tell me what, if any, plans TSA has to restart and complete the work on FedTrack R&D? Yes, sir. Thank, thank you for your question. And also, thank you for your comments about the Chattanooga workforce. And I did talk to the federal security director uh, for that airport to personally relay uh, the comments that you made, and he was very, very appreciative of, yes, of your comments and your involvement and your support of TSA. Uh, with respect to, um, uh, to your question, you know, I, I said at my confirmation hearing that I am very concerned about the uh, level of effort that TSA is able to put forth uh, with surface transportation security writ large, whether it's, it's uh, trucking, freight rail, mass transit, pipelines, over-the-road buses. And one of the things that we have done to address that is we're, we're in the midst of a restructuring which will put uh, under the direct control of now an assistant administrator for surface transportation security operations. So we elevated the position up a notch that oversees surface um, and then are also in the process of giving that assistant administrator direct control over a lot more resources than she previously had direct control over. And this includes all of our surface uh, inspectors that are basically co-located with our inspectors at airports around the country, um, and also a regional staff to be able to work um, closely with FEMA for contingency planning and response, uh, and also for surface transportation security. Um, additionally, uh, I know from looking at my own budget that we are underinvested in resource, re research and development, and that is something that is not reflected in the fiscal 20 budget because we're not ready yet um, to put specific initiatives forward to do that, but will be in our fiscal 21 budget. And this applies both at the screening checkpoint and also in our surface transportation uh, efforts. And so um, I, you know, I pledge to you that I will keep a, a very close eye on this, and, uh, and, and you will see as we complete our restructuring uh, a significant increase in the resources directly attributable to surface transportation security. Yes, sir. Thank you. And as a follow-up, can you speak to the potential return to the taxpayer in terms of preventing a serious incident, sir? Yes, sir. And, and that's something we're always very mindful of is the, you know, the ROI um, is, is enormous on almost every aspect of what, uh, what TSA uh, performs. And we do have a, in my view, a very robust risk assessment and risk management process that kind of looks across the spectrum of of what we're asked to to, um, uh, to secure and makes decisions as to where we need to spend that next available dollar so we do get the highest return on investment for the taxpayer. Uh, but that's a constant part of our process. And I, I just recently um, amended the, the risk assessment and management process to the point where uh, annually it's briefed to me and my senior staff as to what risks we think we're facing and how we're going to manage and mitigate those risks and then quarterly updates after that so it's constantly on our plate now, as we look at our own resource allocations, our own policy decisions, that we keep that in clear focus. Mr. Administrator, thank you. I believe my time is is up. Madam Chairman, I'll reserve for round two. Okay. Mr. Sure. First, thanks for being here. Uh, when TSA first started, there were a lot of problems. Uh, I think that there wasn't really adequate training, and I think also there needed to be a, uh, a theme with the people who work really on the front line that they were in the service business, they were representing Homeland Security, and that there's a way to deal with your job and working with people, and, and that's changed. I think TSA really, uh, whether under your leadership or, or before, but I see uh, you have better training. I think the people, I fly out of BWI Airport a lot in Baltimore, but the people are really friendly. Uh, they do the job the best they can, and they're professional, and that's what you want, because we're, they're still representing the government. So whatever you're doing there, keep it up. And, and I, you know, I want to 
acknowledge the employees. And, it's, and again, I'm sorry that, that uh, uh, unfortunately, for different reasons, I'm not going to get into any politics here, but, you know, that, that you couldn't be paid while you were working. And that, that can't, should not happen again. Um, I want to get into the, uh, the issue of, um, you, I think you've expedited uh, the procurement process for, uh, for fielding compute, computed uh, tomography, uh, CT technology. Uh, known as <coughs> and known as a gold standard in the aviation security. You know, I was a former ranking member of the Intelligence Committee and dealt a lot with terrorism. And, and to this day, I still think that one of the one of the key areas for terrorists is is the airplane. And so you have that burden with you, and you've got to keep up that on a regular basis. And I hope you're communicating with intelligence agencies and other groups too. Um, I'm also pleased uh, that you have just uh, bought over 300. Uh, technology at the screening with Smith Detection. Well, I'm pleased about that during my district. So I want to make sure that it was a competitive bid and all that. Okay, just to cover it. But they tell us why you picked them and why their technology is so good. Yes, sir. Well, well CT, uh, as I, I said. I have one other question. Just try to make it quick. Yes, sir. Um, C CT, CT is a game changer for us in the screening checkpoints. Um, it, it provides an image that is much clearer for the operators to see, and you can move that image around 360 degrees. So you can see a uh, bag and look at it in the opposite direction and see underneath. That's why laptops don't need to come out of carry-on bags. Oh, that's good. Once to see, it's huge. It, 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 and not only that, but the uh, ability to detect explosive levels that we're concerned about is, is night and day compared to the current technology that's out there. So the current contract award, very pleased with the way that process went. We did it within a year, which is unheard of in, in federal procurement. We were able to do that because we had a great staff to be able to execute on it. We had great support from the Department of Homeland Security and also our, our private sector vendors and our private sector partners, airlines and airports, were all in on this. Uh, very, very competitive That's process. Good. And and you saw the results. You know, I had my neck, whole back and neck refused. I have two artificial shoulders, two new, new knees and five screws in each foot. That's an orthopedic surgeon's dream. But, <laughs> you know, I always got nailed every time. And with that new, what you, what you put up, it seems that, that you passed through that without all the checking and that type of thing. Yes, sir. I would give that as an example. You don't need right. to talk about that. My, my body okay. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, a, we have a solution we're looking at for that, too. Good. Well, that's great. The other thing I want to get into uh, is, and this is a little bit more controversial, uh, local airports, airports uh, employ able and competent security guards, but the level of training at TSA is so superior to second to none right now in this industry. And I believe your agency should be uh, staffing exit lanes. That's a, that's a controversial issue because the president's budget cut that. Uh, and that did the same last year. Um, and, you know, the uh, well, last year I think Congress was able to put in $77 million, uh, back in the budget. And again, we're dealing with it again. And, you know, I, hopefully our colleagues come together and, and push for full funding. And this is, this is not a cost that the regional airports can really afford and a lot of the other things that they have to deal with. Customs and Border Protection is using the same mechanism yeah, at, to our seaports. I represent the Port of Baltimore, too, to pass the buck to local governments. And there are certain responsibilities we have. And so we're going to attempt to do what we can to protect our country. But in my opinion, now, I don't want to put you in a bad situation, especially with the boss you have. You never know where, where he's going to be sometimes. And so you don't have to comment on this. Uh, just I want to say that we really feel that this should be your responsibility. We got money in the budget last year, and we're going to try to do it again this year. You know, I'm saving you, so I don't want you to have to comment on this. Yield back. <laughs> Mr. Newhouse. <clears throat> Welcome, Administrator Pekoski. I'm sure I'm going to say that wrong. That's right. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. You, you, you have the unique um, position, I guess, of at least the TSA, of being kind of the face of the federal government to a lot of people in this country. And, it, and that's, uh, that's, that's an opportunity. And I just want to compliment uh, your staff for, for being as professional and efficient as they are when I go through airports and, and, and also for providing that to positive face of the federal government to the general public. So, so thank you for, for the hard work that you have in front of you, but also for the professional way you carry it about. So, um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the chair's question, even though I wasn't in the room. I understand that the, the question of retention was part of what you were thinking. Um, one of the concerns are that uh, some airports continue to face the difficulty of, of uh, retaining uh, TSOs, particularly in a, in a 
dynamic hot economy we're competing um, in Seattle in the Seattle reg region but in particular of course where I fly in and out of uh, twice a week um, I know you've been able to do temporary bonuses and some retention incentives for tight labor markets like that uh, but I'm curious how this budget proposal will uh, allow you to tackle some maybe larger reforms, uh, less uh, temporary things, to change uh, how you might uh, uh, address uh, this issue. Perhaps increase comp compensation um, that could really uh, lead to better retention of TSOs. Um, so, so in in light of that, can you tell me what maybe some of the long-term goals are <coughs> at the TSA to recruit and retain? And, and also uh, certainly how we can help implement and expedite that, uh, that plan. Yes, sir, uh, thank you very much for your comments. And, and um, Seattle Tacoma Airport's a very, very busy airport. Um, and, and we place a, a lot of emphasis on making sure we have uh, the proper staff there uh, because of the volumes that are going through that airport and also the proper number of canine teams mm -hmm. um, to help us with security. Um, there, th there, are, there are several things though that we're doing uh, with respect to the workforce, uh, I think you're right that, that uh, our attrition rates are too high. And Chairwoman Royal had the same, same observation, and, and that's due to a number of factors, um, uh, including the pay levels uh, and including some other things that we do within TSA that are totally within our control to be able to adjust. Um, when TSA was formed in, in, uh, in 2001, uh, the law that is the baseline for TSA was was signed by President Bush on November 19th of 2001, so a very short period of time from 9-11 until yeah. the establishment of the agency. Uh, that Aviation and Transportation Security Act provided an awful lot of authorities to the TSA administrator to be able to manage the screening workforce. And what I am looking to do is to be able to exercise the full extent of those authorities mm -hmm. to be able to improve uh, job satisfaction within the workforce, to be able to look at overall pay and compensation issues so that we be begin to address them in a systematic way. Um, to get at that, we've already uh, put out a TSO, Transportation Security Officer Career Progression Plan, because when, when I came into the, to the agency, there was really no career mapped out for somebody who came in and wanted <coughs> to be a member of the screening workforce. Uh, and so we mapped that out, uh, we published it, we came to this uh, subcommittee and asked for some reprogrammings to be able to execute it. So, so yeah. illustrating where a person could be in five or 10 or yes, 15 sir. years. Mm -hmm. um, as, as, a, as a member of the screening workforce uh, and, and also what training we would provide them, what pay raises sure. would, would come along with that. And also within TSA, you know, I mentioned in my opening statement all the different aspects of performance in TSA, you know, vetting, federal air marshals, international inspectors. Um, we're doing a much better job now of laying out those opportunities to the workforce so that they know that they, hey, you know, if, if I aspire to uh, be an inspector, for example, that I do have a career path that allows me to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that we're doing that's very significant is um, uh, I've convened a Blue Ribbon panel to look at our delivery of human capital services within the agency. Um, that panel is due to report back out to me within the next 30 to 60 days. And I asked them just to take an independent um, look at how we manage our human capital and come back with some recommendations. That will be the basis for how we proceed with respect to resource issues uh, going forward. But I'll give you a, a, a very good example of that. I have all the authority in the world under law to provide longevity increases for my employees. By and large, we don't do that, however, um, because we were uh, constrained by uh, categorizations of funding in, in, in the budget. Um, but I can provide longevity increases every 52 weeks, which is much better than the general schedule can. It's every two or three years. Um, and so I want to step back and take a look at, hey, what makes sense for longevity? Um, where do we reach the point where people we know are making decisions as to whether they stay or they go? Uh, and ensure that we recognize uh, experience at those key critical points. Uh, and I'd be happy to come uh, back to the subcommittee once I have that Blue Ribbon Panel report and just lay out for you what they said. Independent group of folks not employed um, by TSA who are experts in, in human capital management. Uh, final thing is that my focus is on uh, leadership and on properly taking care of the entire workforce. Um, and that's where I ask all my leaders to focus their time as well so that we are keenly aware of what the needs of the workforce are. Good, good. Well, I'd be certainly interested in seeing that if uh, that becomes available and uh, also looking for, for ways that we can work with you as you meet the growing needs of uh, travelers in the, in the country and the growth at uh, airports that we're seeing as well. So, 
Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your questions. I yield back, Madam Chair. Mr. Price. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, welcome, Administrator. We're happy to have you and um, appreciate your testimony. Let me uh, turn to the area of general aviation and ask about your, your work in, in that area and in cooperation with uh, general aviation uh, stakeholders. Uh, the recently uh, enacted F FAA uh, Reauthorization Act included provisions which encourage more focus on TSA's efforts with general aviation airports and operators and specifically encourages a dedicated general aviation representative. Now, now part of the rationale for such a dedicated staff person is, is the desire to support general aviation's efforts to encourage and improve secure operations. Uh, this includes efforts to modernize existing security programs, particularly in specialized areas like the DCA Access Standard Security Program and Gateway Airports, which are used to provide access during temporary flight restrictions for special events and, and, and so on. A number of these efforts underway. I think it's fair to say that the progress um, in most of them has been limited so far. So that, that leads to my question. What steps are being taken by TSA to encourage modernization and use of these programs um, in a responsive and timely manner for stakeholders? Uh, how are you prioritizing programs such as uh, DASSP, uh, Gateway, and other security programs um, used by general avi aviation aircraft to increase uh, operational flexibility? Yes, sir. I, you know, we spend um, uh, a lot of time making sure that any interest group having to do with uh, aviation security or surface transportation security has a clear entry point into the TSA organization and somebody that can champion um, their issues so that would be an expert uh, and be able to reflect on, on a short notice question generally what that segment of the industry uh, would desire. Uh, additionally, we have the Aviation Security Advisory Committee that's a, uh, a group of volunteers who has provided invaluable advice to me as the administrator, and I use them extensively, and I know general aviation interests are well represented uh, there. I have met with um, uh, individuals from the general aviation industry over the course of my time as the administrator. Uh, I'm very familiar with the concerns that they have. Uh, we did, in fact, look very specifically at the, um, the uh, D.C. special access uh, area and the regulations attendant there too uh, and determined that what we had in place um, made sense given the threat that we still see. Um, but we said that we'd be willing to look at, at, at ways that we could provide an equivalent level of security by potentially doing something a little bit differently. And that's generally an approach that we've taken with industry is to say, hey, here's the security outcome that we need to achieve. He, you know, this is our mission. There's, this is the outcomes that we need to achieve. And then how would you propose that we achieve those outcomes? Because I want to hear from the industry as to what specific ways and measures, these are folks that are all running businesses, um, that they have a, a, a certain perspective that I think is incredibly valuable to our decision process. And that's, and that's the process we use is, hey, here's the, here's the threat, here's the outcome, tell us how you would achieve that outcome, and then we, we, we work together um, to then determine what specific measure to be put in place. And uh, can you give us some estima estimation of, of the state of play with respect to, uh, to these efforts? Uh, how, uh, how successful have they been? How far along are they? Uh, what, what would be maybe an example of the uh, progress you hope to make? Yes, sir, I'll, I'll give you an example um, with commercial non-general aviation. I think that's, a, that's the best example. Um, we were facing a threat that had to do with um, powders being introduced into a cabin of an aircraft. Um, we were able to uh, bring representatives of the major carriers into TSA headquarters, all had security clearances. Uh, we told, we revealed with them at a certain level what that threat entailed um, and told them what security outcome we want to achieve. Uh, we went back and forth uh, in this process for about two months and then came up with a series of measures that the true success of it is that we significantly raised security at our domestic airports and our international last points of departure airports and most passengers never even noticed that something had happened. And, and the nuance change was that we asked passengers to take large volumes of powders out of their carry-on bag. Uh, and then we put certain protocols in place. You know, we had to decide what volume and then how we were going to resolve what those powders were. But that was a very successful process uh, that actually has been adopted by other countries uh, as a result. So my point is, um, as open as we can be, a lot of collaboration, and then a clear explanation as to why we go down a certain path. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Ming. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Mr. Administrator, for being here today. Uh, I want to, as a frequent flyer through LaGuardia Airport in Queens, New York, very grateful to you and the TSA agents who work there, uh, who I see at least twice a week. So thank you to uh, your commitment. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, a report ex um, from the House Committee on Oversight from the fall 2018. Um, revelations about the hostile work environment, history of sexual harassment and retaliation. Um, wanted to know if what has been done to address this issue from an institutional perspective. Has anyone been terminated? Have there been new trainings? Um, and how can we ensure that employees are able to report malfeasance without any sort of retribution? Yes, thank you, thank you for the question, and, and you know, I, I have been very, very strong on this issue. I, I think that um, job satisfaction, workplace environment are things we control largely, and we need to make sure, one, we comply with the law, um, and, and secondly, that we create an environment where every person who is an employee of TSA can succeed. Um, and so what we've done specifically to respond to your question is, yes, we've provided a lot more training, but I think what's important is um, what the leadership emphasis is. And uh, I published in a couple of documents. Uh, first one was the uh, a new strategy for TSA that I published about a year ago. Uh, and one of the core values that we, we, we put into the TSA strategy was respect, because that was not a core value of the agency. And to me, that means respect for each other in the workplace uh, and also respect for passengers as they, as they um, receive the services that, that we provide. Uh, first core value is integrity, second respect, the third is commitment. Um, the other thing that we did was when we published the administrator's intent, which is a document that basically says, hey, while I'm the administrator of this agency, here's what I'm going to do to execute on that strategy. In the administrator's intent, I put a whole series of leadership principles. The very first leadership principle is caring for your people uh, because I want to create a leadership culture that gets at these uh, longstanding inside TSA um, job satisfaction and work environment uh, issues. I, I'm happy to report a uh, couple things. One is that our FEV scores, the Federal Employee Viewpoint Survey, that survey that's done every year of every single federal agency, shows noticeable progress across all dimensions. We didn't go down or stay the same in any dimension. We went up in every single one. Uh, additionally, if you look at um, the complaints that we received, those complaint rates are way down um, uh, from this year over last. And so I just look at those trends um, to say, hey, are we on the right track here and what else do we need to do? Um, finally, uh, I've asked every leader to be open and accessible to the people that they work with. And the only way you're going to do that, if, if you're um, the federal security director at LaGuardia Airport, the only way you're going to have a feeling for how well your people feel about the job that they perform and the people that they work with is to walk around and to talk to them. You, you can get them one-on-one -on -one and just ask some questions, have, have, have give them the opportunity to get to know you and you them. And then you'll get some direct feedback. And as I travel around, I get a lot of direct feedback. And I can tell almost instantly how an airport operates, um, you know, after about three or four minutes on the ground, just in a couple of interactions with people. Right. Um, but had, from the revelations from that hearing, had anyone been terminated or what were the results? Uh, fr from that hearing, um, the, the incidents that were referenced in that hearing uh, go back several years. And, um, and, and what I said at the hearing was, uh, I am not going to go back and re-adjudicate things that happened several years ago because as long as, as, as I'm told that the process um, was, was uh, not fundamentally flawed uh, and decision makers made decisions with the facts that were available to them, that I wasn't going to go reverse those actions, but that, that we would take very, very quick action on any future incidents that have occurred, and that's what we have done. Um, and so, you know, I, th and in many cases, the actions that were the subject of that hearing had already been taken and involved uh, agreements between the employees affected and the agency. So, you know, I really couldn't undo uh, those from my perspective. Okay. Um, so I have a second quick question. Um, 
about religious and racial profiling. Since 2012, over 700 complaints have been filed against the TSA using the Fly Rights app addressing mistreatment and discrimination. Uh, in contradiction to TSA protocol, uh, Sikh Americans have been required to remove their turbans. Muslim Americans have been interrogated about uh, which mosques they attend, for example. Um, to ensure that this type of profiling does not occur at airports across the country, what types of accountability systems uh, are currently in place? Uh, a, a number of things. Uh, fir first, um, we, we screen on average 2.4, 2.5 million passengers a day. Um, and that number 700 goes back to 2012. So if you look at the volume of passengers, uh, to put that number 700 in context, but there are still 700 people who had a complaint. I'm, I'm very mindful of that. Um, and you know, we have a process that, that, that we have that, that allows people to register a complaint uh, and then us to get back to the individuals, uh, do whatever investigation is, is deemed necessary at that point in time, and try to resolve these as expeditiously as we can. Um, additionally, um, I have uh, made it a, a point as I'm traveling around the country to visit different groups uh, around the country just to be able to establish that connection from the, from the top leadership of TSA with, with different communities uh, in this nation. So we're trying to, to make sure that we have a very good dialogue. And I, you know, we have a multicultural day um, every year uh, in TSA. It's widely attended, and, uh, it, and the attendance is growing year after year. So I think our levels of communication are very good. Final point I'd make is that um, when we see um, a passenger who has a complaint, first thing we do is, is, is we want to ensure that our officers were following our standard operating procedures. And I, I will tell you that in almost every case, that is the case. Um, so then we back up our officers. Our officers were following our procedures. But then the second question is, are our procedures still the appropriate procedures? Because every case we use to kind of re-review our procedures to make sure they're appropriate given the security concerns that we have. Okay. Thank you. I yield back. Mr. Aguilar. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thanks, Administrator, for, for being here. And I know I, I missed um, your answer uh, to questions related to the shutdown um, and working without pay. Um, but uh, your, your folks do uh, an amazing job uh, each and every day. Um, but I did want to ask specific to those issues and morale. How is morale among um, uh, TSA employees? Uh, uh, and if you could, you know, benchmark that against uh, things from from years past, uh, you know, where are we at today? I, th I think the, the the best indicator of morale is is that federal employee viewpoint survey because it is every year. It's the same questions, um, uh, and uh, last year, for example, that was what's called the census year, which means that every single employee was issued an email invitation to participate in the survey. Um, our our uh, performance on that FEV survey is constantly improving. We went up in every single category across the board. Um, and I think our average increase was three percentage points, which is pretty good give it given the size of the agency. What's the response rate? How many people? What's the percentage? Um, I, I will have to get back to you on the record uh, with that, but I want to say it's something around 19% or so, uh, which is actually not, not a bad response rate. But um, one of the things that we're going to do this year is because most of our employees are shift, you know, doing shift work at a screening checkpoint, and they only have a limited number of computers to access, is to c continue to make a push, because I want to see as high a, a level of participation as we can, because that will give me more confidence in the results. I appreciate it. Uh, news reports have mentioned that a team of TSA agents made a trip to Saudi Arabia with the goal of helping uh, Saudi Arabia with aviation security and technical assistance. Can you expand on the, that government-to-government -government, uh, relationship, uh, and how long is it scheduled to continue? Uh, that government-to-government -government relationship uh, actually started out with a technical cooperation agreement back in 2008. Um, and, and really the process from 2008 to today has been a series of visits to really understand what the Saudi government was seeking uh, in terms of our expertise um, and where we could best help them out. Uh, and so there have been a series of visits back and forth over the intervening years. Um, we signed an MOU, um, we being the Department of State and TSA, um, in September of 2017 um, as to how we were going to operationalize uh, the request that the Saudi government had made. Um, but to date, uh, where we sit right now is we're still going back and forth um, on 
scheduling and figuring out exactly what we're going to provide, but we haven't actually provided any training at this point. Does the MOU talk about um, time frame? Um, the, the, the MOU goes out, I, I think, until um, 2023, if my memory serves me correctly. Okay, yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. You get back, Madam Chair. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I want to uh, follow quickly on the heels of my colleague from California with a question, um, or really a statement, about our TSOs. Um, these are folks who are abused and ridiculed for just doing their job. I mean, it, a, abuse and ridicule is not in their job description, but one would think it was, given how I've witnessed, and I know so many of us have wit witnessed them uh, being treated. And, uh, and then on top of that, they went through a government shutdown and did those same jobs without pay. So have we now fully paid all of the TSOs that did not receive pay during the shutdown? Yes, ma'am, and, and in, in any large organization, you're always going to have a very small percentage of people unrelated to the shutdown or just that have pay issues that we work very quickly to resolve. But um, a, a lot of the pay issues that we had immediately following the resumption of full operations and appropriation uh, were mostly related to um, system issues uh, with the pay system itself. It wasn't the actions that we were taking. It was actually executing through the pay system. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you're aware on January 6, 2017, a man walked into the baggage claim area of Fort Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport, uh, collected his luggage, removed a firearm from that bag, opened fire on his fellow passengers, and murdered five people and injured six others. Um, the, the, the aftermath of that shooting uh, rampage was nothing short of chaos, uh, mostly due to a lack of coordination. The takedown of the suspect was, uh, was, was immediate. Um, since that date, I know I've been working uh, closely with TSA and with our airports and our <coughs> airlines to ensure that we have a more effective model for ensuring coordination between federal, state, and local law enforcement at airports so that the response to similar incidents, because we had one at LAX, we had one at JFK, um, can be swift and coordinated. And so after researching and talking with many airport professionals, I'm convinced that this can most effectively be accomplished by establishing unified operations centers in airports, which I had the good fortune to talk to with you about in my office the other day, that would serve as a centralized hub for coordination during a security incident like what we had at our airport. So can you share with us whether you agree that a unified command and control center at airports, particularly the CAT-X airports, would improve the response to security incidents? So I, I completely agree that Having a unified operations center at any large airport, actually any airport, is very beneficial to the day-to-day -day operation of the airport and certainly to the operation of an airport when there's an emergency like what happened at Fort Lauderdale Airport, unfortunately. Um, and, and I also believe that um, a, the best model is to have them up on a day-to-day -day basis and not start them when you have an emergency because right. that loss of time and just the, the coordination that needs to occur, uh, precious seconds are lost and that really counts as, as we saw. Uh, in Fort Lauderdale. Um, there are provisions in the TSA Modernization Act um, that, that have us set some guidelines for airport operation centers, and we're on pace uh, to do that because I want to see that uh, in writing and publish that as an agency. Uh, and then we have scheduled uh, in the Mod Act a brief uh, to members on this very topic. Um, so I'm looking forward to both those opportunities. Great, and I look forward to working with you as we discussed on my legislation so that we can further actualize that, that, that concept. And lastly, um, I wanted to touch on the advanced imaging technology that since 2015 has been approved and utilized by our international partners at some of the world's busiest airports. Uh, the newer next generation AIP technology used in Europe and internationally has been at the Transportation Security Lab uh, since 2014. Data from TSL assessments clearly indicate that this new technology performs better than TSA's current technology. It's less intrusive. It makes it a little bit less confront quite a bit less confrontational for our TSOs when there is an alarm. Can the TSA leverage the performance data of our international partners to reduce the time and TSA resources needed to accelerate the validation of the new AIT technology and make it available more quickly for airports to equip new terminals? Uh, yes, ma'am, absolutely. In, in fact, we have already certified uh, that technology, which means that we have tested it in our, in our labs and we've said it meets the performance specifications that are required uh, for use in our in our screening checkpoints. So we are already doing that. And um, and to your larger point, 
we work very, very closely with all of our international partners on their technology advancements so that we don't repeat each other's good work and that, and that we benefit from the lessons that each other learns. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're back. Um, Administrator, um, the administration's budget request for transportation security officer staffing would accommodate uh, a passenger growth rate of 2.5 percent, but it estimates that the actual pr uh, passenger growth rate is expected to be 4.5 percent. Why is there a, a mismatch, and wouldn't that result in an expansion of wait times at checkpoints? Yes, ma'am, you're, you're correct. Um, the, the resources we're requesting will basically accommodate a 2.5 increase. We know it's 4.5 or 5 percent. Um, but we also know that in certain airports ac around the country, we really can't add any more people because we're, we're, we're maxed out in terms of the number of screening lanes uh, that we have. And so that's a factor is that the, f the fact that in some airports you just can't add any more lanes even if you knew you needed to. Uh, and we essentially wait with the airports for infrastructure improvement projects to give us that additional capacity. Um, also, you know, we were looking for ways to become ever more efficient in the screening operations that we conduct. Uh, and I'll give you two really good examples. Um, for the CT, the, the CAT scan x-ray technology that we're looking at, um, that will eventually make us much better to be able to specifically isolate in a carry-on bag. If, if, if the bag alarms through the x-ray, what specifically we need to look at. And that should speed the process along. Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz mentioned the AIT technology, and, and she's right. With, with the current technology, our false alarm rate is, is higher than what we'd all like it to be. Uh, the new technology that we're looking at brings that false alarm rate down. Uh, and so what that means is that we have, um, w when we need to do a pat down of a passenger, it's, it's more likely than not that there's an anomaly, something on that person's body that alarmed the machine. Um, and so the technology advancements should improve our efficiency overall. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we are, are just in a position that um, with the top line resources that the department has and the TSA has, we really can't get up to the full 4.5. I don't think we really need to. Um, and settling at, at 2.5 is, I think, a very reasonable place to be at this point in time. Um, the budget request recommends the elimination of three programs that Congress has repeatedly endorsed, the Visible Intermodal Prevention and Response Teams, the LEO reimbursement program and TSA staffing of exit lanes at certain airports. Are the elimination of these programs based on assessments that they are poor investments of tax dollars um, or are there other reasons that you can talk about? Yes, ma'am. All, all three programs are very valuable programs and, and um, they are appropriate investments. Um, uh, the Viper teams are appropriate investments. They provide security and surface transportation and, and airport um, centers. Um, the uh, law enforcement reimbursement reimburses our law enforcement partners who provide a presence at our screening checkpoints. Um, and, uh, you know, I think both of those are, are very valuable programs. Um, uh, it really is an issue of when, when you look at, uh, you know, a top line budget number, um, not just for TSA, but for the entire department, what kinds of trade-offs do we have to make to stay within that top line budget number? And there are some difficult choices uh, that, that are made in any process like that. Um, but, but I would say without question that, that uh, those are, are important programs. We're just fiscally not able to support them in this budget. Okay. Yeah. Now, if we were able to find additional uh, resources, uh, what would you re recommend in terms of these three programs? I mean, that we could fund all three, or if we have budget constraints, could you tell us the order in which you would uh, prioritize these? Uh, y y yes, ma'am. Um, I would prioritize them um, Viper first um, because the Viper program also provides ground-based assignments for federal air marshals. It gives them a chance to, to rotate from being in, the, in an aircraft on a regular basis to being in a ground-based assignment. It's good for uh, the physical well-being of, of our federal air marshals, and it's also good for their family um, and, and just kind of stabilizes um, their schedules uh, much more so than being in the air. So I would put Viper first. Um, I would put law enforcement officer reimbur reimbursement second. And then the third and only third because I think we might be able to get some technology solutions for this is exit lane staffing. Because when you think about it, um, we ought to be able to put a technology in place that prevents somebody com from coming in the reverse direction in an exit lane. Uh, and so I'd rather push on the technology solution 
for that rather than the than the people solution. Okay. Mr. Fleischman. Thank you again, Madam Chair, and uh, Mr. Administrator. Thank you for this very thorough hearing. Mm -hmm. Uh, sir, I understand that the TSA is in the process of updating key screening technology at our airports in order to keep passenger, passengers safe from threats that continue to evolve. I think using contractors in certain airports and registered known traveler programs like TSA Pre and Clear are areas where we have tried to make the screening process faster and more efficient, not only for the TSA, but also for the traveling public. How is TSA using commercial technology to improve efficiency of operations at the checkpoint? Sir, uh, almost everything at our checkpoints is, is either commercial off the shelf or a adaptation of commercial off the shelf technology. Um, and that's where we're proceeding for most of the technology infusion uh, for the next several years at our screening checkpoints. But as I, in, in answer to your, to your first question, about research and development, there, is, there are some aspects of what we need to do at our screening checkpoints that there really is not a commercial solution available and we just need to get into some basic research and development uh, on those items. Um, I, and, and I also think it's really important to um, be able to apply the security processes that we do based on the risk that passengers uh, present. And that's where the cr that credential authentication technology comes in so importantly because, you know, just think from a technology perspective, we would, we're going from um, taking somebody's driver's license or passport and visually examining it, putting ultraviolet light on it or looking at it through a magnifying glass and then trying to compare what's on the credential with the passenger in front of the officer to the point where those credentials get inserted into a machine and the machine comes back and says, yes, this is a valid Florida or a valid California or a valid Tennessee driver's license. And then the, the really good part about it is that it automatically pulls the information from the credential. So it'll pull the name, uh, gender, and date of birth from the credential. And in real time, while the passenger's standing there, send that information back to our secure flight database, which will return a result that will say, yes, this is a, a, a bona fide pre-check passenger. This is a standard lane passenger. This is someone who needs additional screening. And the other part is it will also say, and this passenger has this flight today. So, so we'll see the travel information, we'll validate the credential, the image will come up on a screen. And so what ends up happening for the officer is rather than being heads down, trying to match some very small printed uh, information with, with the passenger in front of them, uh, the machine takes care of that, a lot of that automatically and then all of the information comes up on a screen, so you're looking more at the passenger, which I think is very beneficial from a security perspective, and it gives you the opportunity to have a conversation with the passenger as well. So I think the, the, the technology part of this uh, is gonna be critically important for not just uh, passenger convenience, but really for security effectiveness, because this is also from an identity perspective, very significant improvement. Yes, sir. How has TSA fostered relationships with the private sector, specifically when it comes to new technologies? So the, re the reason we were able to move the um, computed tomography uh, acquisition so quickly is because of our relationships with the private sector. And because of the authorities that you have provided in law, um, we can accept um, uh, gifts of, of technology from the private sector, uh, as long as it's certified for operation in our screening checkpoints. And so what we were able to do is do a lot of operational test and evaluation with equipment that was gifted to us from the private sector, which sped along that acquisition process. Yes, sir. As you move forward with rolling out new systems, sir, are you collaborating with your partners to continue best practices to keep the security lines moving? Yes, sir. Uh, we, we collaborate on everything, and I'm always interested if there are better ways that we can collaborate that, that we'll do them, because I want to make sure we have good, robust dialogue with our partners. Very good. Uh, very briefly, the fiscal year 2020 budget request proposes uh, to draw down funds from the Aviation Security Capital Fund to finance additional CT screening machines. I wholeheartedly endorse increasing the number of CT scanners in our airports, and I agree that purchasing the scanners using the Aviation Security Capital Fund meets the eligi eligibility criteria for the fund. However, I have concerns that the dollars in the fund have already been spoken for. They've been allocated to very worthwhile security projects already on the drawing board for airports around the country. Can you say with certainty, sir, that this purchase will not have an unintended effect on delaying security projects 
already on the books. Uh, so the reason why we, we chose to go that route was because we felt that it would not have an effect on projects that were already on the books, but, that, but we also viewed this as a one-time event. Yes, sir. One final question. Is the proposal a one-time deal for fiscal 2020, or do you anticipate using this accounting practice again? Uh, so we, we'll evaluate it every year, but at this point, a one-time on 2020. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair, you will back. Ms. Lush, Austin, and Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had one additional question, um, and I know we all already touched on the, the SAMS program as well as uh, the Viper program, but um, having been involved in, in safety issues in my legislative agenda for m many, many years, I really have sympathy for the difficulty associated with directly correlating the tangible benefits of programs that are intended to prevent harm, like the SAMS program. Um, and I know the DHS IG um, expressed concern over the contribution that to aviation security that the uh, SAMS have, SAMS being the air marshals, uh, for those that don't speak acronym. Um, so uh, having said that, um, and knowing that we have safety, uh, safety programs that we utilize to make sure that we can put obstacles in the path of someone who might try to do someone else harm, and there's not really a way to measure, per se, what we prevented from occurring. Um, can you explain how you're moderni modernizing the FAMS program to address threats faced today? And then also, just in terms of, you, you r alluded to it in on the previous answer, but um, I mean, I don't think people really realize how much, uh, how, how debilitating it can be on the human body for an individual to fly and go up and down and up and down. I mean, I know how debilitating it is just to be a commuter, um, but to fly, you know, three or so times a day. Um, can you address whether you believe there's some value in giving the air marshals some ground-based assignments like the Viper teams, uh, which certainly also provide a valuable service uh, so that they have a visible deterrent at airports which would obviously help us expand our reach in terms of protecting people and also address the impact, uh, the physical impact on our air marshals. Yes, ma'am, a, a couple things. Um, we, we just changed the, uh, the concept of operations for how we deploy the federal air marshals. And I can't really go into a lot of detail on that new con ops in this setting, but suffice it to say that um, the new con ops results in much more effective employment of a very, very valuable and limited resource. Um, I would also say that you know, I have great admiration for our federal air marshals. They perform a difficult job. It's not easy sitting in a plane uh, for hours on end. If you're on a domestic deployment, sometimes three flights mm -hmm. in a given day, uh, just three uh, takeoffs and landing sets uh, is, is, is fatiguing, and they've got to be alert all the time. Um, and so we, we changed the concept of operations to be much more risk-based. Uh, and I think it's got an awful lot more fidelity to it. And we also changed the way we place the air marshals in aircraft to be able to execute on that concept of operations. Once we put that in place, uh, we agreed with the Inspector General in that we did not have good measures. And like you said, it's very hard to measure prevention, yeah. right? Um, but nonetheless, we, we can measure certain things that will give us sort of a surrogate for how, how we're doing. Um, and as we publish this new CONOPS, will be a set of measures that we'll put in place to be able to assess the performance of this important and really this last layer of security. That's what I think about all the time is, you know, we, we spend a lot of money in all the vetting operations, very, very important for us to do, a lot of money in our screening checkpoints, a lot of money in, in check, um, check baggage screening. Um, we do really want to have that last line of defense with the Federal Air Marshal Service. Um, and and as, you, as you've correctly stated, I mean, it, it, is, it is hard to be a flying federal air marshal for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years on end. Uh, and so one of the things that we're looking at is how do we better manage that very important force um, of individuals for us? And, and part of that analysis is um, can we identify more ground-based assignments to give them uh, a bit of a break? Um, and, and also, importantly, to use their significant expertise. I mean, you know, these folks are experts in, in, yeah. in law enforcement. They're experts in aviation security. We, we can really get a lot more value, I think, um, by doing it that way. Absolutely, and ma Madam Chair, uh, I think it's important to just remind people, as we got a very unfortunate reminder at FLL, that our 
transportation security officers are part of the layers of protection safety to be to be successful requires layers of protection because you need one there and when that fails then you have another and you know you can't have infinite layers but the air marshals are one of those layers and like you said the last line of defense and what we were reminded about and i think many people weren't even consciously aware that our t s o s actually are there to protect the airplane and so we do have some work to do to educate the traveling public about what the role of the various security and safety responsibilities are at the airport law enforcement t s o s the vipers that you know the air marshals and and make sure that we continue to move forward on the discussion that that has been sparked from f l l and other airports on you know the run hide fight concept and who's responsible for actually making sure that we can secure the airport and protect passengers that aren't traveling about to travel on an airplane thank you you're back i just have a follow up question on the issue that was raised by the ranking member about the credential authentication technology. How long will it take to get to full operating capability? Madam Chair, we should be able to purchase about 500 of the credential authentication technology systems in fiscal 19, and then the budget requests another 300 or so more. It's going to take us about two more years after that to get the full operating capability, but we're going to be very smart as to how we how we deploy these uh, uh, systems, and we're going to start with our pre-check uh, lanes because um, one of the concerns that um, the Congress has expressed and, uh, and I share is that we need to make sure that the individuals who voluntarily give us their background information and their biometrics get some noticeable, tangible benefit from their investment in the pre-check program. Because for us, this now becomes a trusted traveler, and we adjust our security based on that. Um, and so I want to put the cap machines, and I want to put technology where um, uh, it will help accelerate a, uh, a pre-check passenger or a global entry passenger's passage through security so we can focus our efforts uh, more so on, on the individuals that need a little bit more attention. Have there been any issue with regards to the CLEAR program or anything that's raised any concerns about that? Th there's there's a, um, a difference between um, um, the Trusted Traveler programs and a Registered Traveler program. A Trusted Traveler is a government program where we have the full background of individuals and we've vetted those individuals and we also have their biometrics. Um, a Registered Traveler program is exists for the sole purpose of validating identity. It doesn't do any government vetting uh, of those passengers and some some registered traveler clients are standard lane passengers and some are pre-check passengers it kind of varies across the board although the predominance are pre-check passengers um, uh, and and you know w w we're looking at how can we best integrate um, all the capability across but with the credential authentication technology because that's going to have risk-based information on passengers um, that that is a um, a very critical important function in our screening checkpoint. It's the it's basically your entering argument to screening, uh, and and that is something given that the information that's available to the officers, particularly as we get this live connection with the technology, um, that uh, is so integral that it's 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 a it's a government function uh, in our view, and so we're we're exploring uh, with our registered traveler partner how how um, uh, we move forward. Uh, given that the CAT deployment is really beginning now and, and it's going to be in earnest in, in fiscal 20 as well. Do you have any further questions? Great question. Okay. Sure. We still have a little bit of time, so I'm going to just okay. leave it up to you. If are, are there any questions that we didn't ask that you wish we had or any additional information <laughs> that you would like to provide uh, the subcommittee? Um, a, a couple things, ma'am, and I appreciate the opportunity because it's, it's, it's rare that, that, that a, a witness gets this opportunity. Um, you will see in a very short period of time our first capital investment plan um, that, that kind of lays out what we, what we know we need to invest over the future year's Homeland Security Plan. And, and it's going to be uh, constrained by the levels that the administration has um, uh, approved in the FISIP, which is, is, is a logical uh, presentation, but at least you'll get to see all of the all the projects that we envision so you can understand the scale 
of the technology investment that we think is needed. You know, we've talked about the CT x-rays and we've talked about the credential authentication technology. Um, those are two that are already underway. CT, you know, to give you a, a kind of a sense of, of a scale, um, we're going to have 300 with this current fiscal 19 purchase that we just we just made. Uh, another 300 uh, if the fiscal 20 levels get approved. That's 600, but we have about 2,400 X-ray systems in the entire 440 airports that are federalized. Um, so you know it, it makes progress, but we still got a long way to go. Um, when Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz was talking about the AIT technology, the technology you put your hands over your heads. Um, that's not even uh, a, a, an acquisition program at this point in time. Now, we, as I mentioned to her, we have certified that technology, which means that if uh, an airport or an airline wants to gift it to us, they've got some standards of performance that the machines need to meet that we, and we will tell them which machines are certified to those standards of performance so we can accept those gifts. But there's no formal acquisition program for that. So just, just, just context of, hey, you know, more technology investment is needed. And, I'd be most happy uh, at, at anybody's convenience uh, to, to sit down with you and kind of lay out the threat um, and then look at the capability of the existing screening system and it will really illuminate why we need to make um, these technology enhancements. And the other thing is, you know, I think that has a big effect on the screening workforce. Uh, you know, when you're working with more up-to-date tools, particularly the on-body anomaly detection, for example, if you, if you don't need to do as many pat-downs as you're doing, because nobody likes to be patted down and nobody likes to conduct a pat-down. Um, if we can get technology that, that gives us more certainty in that process and better detectability, I think it's a win for passengers and certainly a win uh, for, for screening effectiveness. Um, the, other th the other thing that, that, that I would emphasize is um, how important uh, the human dimension of what we do is. And you all, you all know that you've, you've all expressed uh, appreciation for the work of the TSA workforce. Um, one of the things that, that has been um, uh, really uh, something that, that I reflect on all the time is how complex an agency this is. And, you know, most people think of, of TSA and they think of the screening checkpoint as the only part of the agency. Th and it's a very important part and certainly the most visible part of TSA. But there's a lot of work that TSA does that most people don't realize uh, that we're doing. They don't see the the uh, the checked luggage that they you know that's going to go in the hold of an aircraft that that we uh, inspect. They don't see our inspectors walking around airports, making sure that there's compliance with our airport security plans and our and our carrier security plans. Um, they don't see all of the international inspectors that we have all around the world, making sure that if you get on a flight at an airport that has a direct flight to the United States, that we have um, a presence there and we are looking out for the security levels. Uh, in those airports. They don't see um, all of the individuals that, that work in our intelligence enterprise, uh, that do all the very important vetting work um, that, that, that uh, is important to be able to make sure that we've properly assessed the risk by passenger. And they really don't see everybody that, that needs to support that enterprise. And we, we've got thousands and thousands of very dedicated employees that make sure that, you know, um, that, that our IT systems are up and running, that our pay systems are up and running, that our human capital systems are up and running. Um, and so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex enterprise. And, you know, I'm very proud of every single person uh, in the agency because without, you know, we need everybody to be able to perform our mission. Uh, Congressman Wasserman Schultz talked about the Federal Air Marshal Service. They're designed to be not visible um, to passengers. And, and I am so glad that we have um, that layer of security. So I, I would just, you know, take the opportunity just to, uh, emphasized in my opening statement, I said, hey, there's two, two really important things we need in this budget, technology investment and investment in, in our workforce. And I really appreciate uh, the, the flexibility of this subcommittee in working our reprogramming requests along the way as we want to move some, some money around to be able to accomplish some of the initiatives that we know we can self-fund, but we just need to change the, 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 the nature of, of the funding. Uh, and, and you've been very, very helpful uh, in that regard, and, and we very much appreciate it. And you see a couple of uh, actually, three uniformed officers um, behind me. Uh, we, we made a change in our policy in TSA about a year ago, um, where you know I wanted to see a uniform presence in the agency, and and I wanted to have um, transportation security officers, and they're all supervisory transportation security officers. I wanted to have them nearby all the senior leadership, so that when we were having policy discussions affecting our workforce, that we had people that are actually represented the front line right there in the discussion, so that they could 
uh, give us their input. And then also over my right shoulder is a member of the Federal Air Marshal Service, also uh, on my front office staff that, that uh, provides me that same perspective uh, from a Federal Air Marshal um, perspective. And, and, and it's really valuable in that um, a TSO may not call me, but they will definitely call um, Charles or Cavell or, or Pam, and, uh, and they will, and a Air Marshal will call Kara, um, but they may not call me. And so we're just trying to, to improve the levels uh, of communication. Uh, but really, I, I sincerely, I said in my opening statement that I appreciate the oversight that you provide because your, your questions um, cause us to constantly think about what we're doing to make sure that, that we've thought it through. And, uh, and you and your staffs have been there to support us every step of the way, and so we really appreciate it. Well, welcome <laughs> to all of you, and thank, thank you for everything that you do. Um, as you can tell, there is bipartisan support, and we will do everything we can to, to help you to continue to protect our nation. Thank, thank you, you, Chairwoman. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ranking Member. Thanks.